Great. All right. Just give me a second to share, everybody. Um, all right. View slideshow. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for being with us today on The Real Truth About Health. My presentation is about toxins in our food supply and what we can do. Now, many of you might be already aware that there are GMOs in our food supply. Up to 85% of packaged foods in the United States contain GMOs, including canola. The most prevalent are canola oils um, and corn and soy and sugar products. Up to any 85% or 100 to 100% of these main commodity crops are GMO grown in the USA. And I'll get into that to telling you what that means more. Predominantly, that means they're genetically engineered to have certain traits that we want to have. That's a, um, and, and some of them are um, things like alfalfa, papaya, crooked neck squash, banana, potatoes, not as prevalent. Apples, the apples are made to not brown, uh, but they're all unlabeled in the grocery stores. The most prevalent one are GMOs that are engineered to withstand pesticides uh, I mean, sorry, to contain pesticides. So when, when you eat that corn, the pesticide is built right in. That way, when a bug eats the corn, its stomach will explode because of the pesticide built right into the corn. Uh, unfortunately, that can also cause problems with uh, humans as well and animals that eat predominantly eat that GMO corn. Um, it's also used for ethanol. Uh, but the, the most common GMOs are GMOs that are genetically engineered to withstand herbicides, as you see being sprayed right now, this is predominantly GMO um, soy and other crops that are genetically engineered to withstand glyphosate, the toxic uh, a chemical ingredient in Roundup. There are many toxins in Roundup, but glyphosate is one of them. So 80% of GMOs are engineered to withstand glyphosate. And glyphosate is also sprayed as a drying agent on non-GMO, non-organic food. And we'll get into that. Now, glyphosate is the active chemical ingredient and what is known as Roundup or Ranger Pro. And you should know these three things, main things, three things about glyphosate um, be, in order to understand why we're focused on it so much, why it's so harmful and why it's connected to over 40 different uh, Western diseases right now. Number one is a patented anti uh, antimicrobial. It destroys beneficial gut bacteria and promotes the pathogenic gut bacteria. And what that means is that when it's destroying your pathogenic gut, I mean, sorry, when it's destroying your beneficial gut bacteria, it's destroying the stronghold of your immune system. And it's also destroying your body's capability to make hormones um, the end and, and to, um, make available certain compounds to your body that are crucial for how your body functions. For instance, uh, melatonin and serotonin are stored in your gut. And so if you are destroying your body's ability to make them, you're not going to be able to sleep. Well, you may have, um, uh, uh, oh, lessened say being less satiated, meaning you're not as content. So you may eat more, uh, watch more porn, gamble more, drink more alcohol. You may, you know, you know, you don't have that ability to feel satiated as you would had you had a beneficial gut bacteria in your gut. So it impacts many different aspects of your body, um, by impacting your gut bacteria. Of course, it's also the stronghold of your immune system and, uh, you're all pretty much all disease starts in the gut, according to Hippocrates. So it is a very, very bad idea for us to be eating food that destroys our beneficial gut bacteria. I mean, for us to be eating chemicals that destroy our beneficial gut bacteria. Number two, it's a chelator. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this in a minute, but basically what a chelator means is that it glyphosate holds or makes unavailable the vital nutrients of any living thing it touches, causing dysfunction and DNA mutations, because without those vital nutrients, the, your DNA and your, uh, your body functions are, don't work properly. Okay. And I'll say more about chelation in just a second. Glyphosate is also defined by the EPA on, a th on the fact sheet as a reproductive effector. That means it impacts our, end our, endocrine, our endocrine system, uh, all, you know, our entire hormonal system. It can cause thyroid damage. Uh, it has been proven to damage sperm in four different ways, form, functioning, mo mobility, and quantity. Uh, it's basically making men sterile. And it does cause liver disease. Glyphosate has been proven to cause liver disease at very low levels. 
uh, and cause kidney damage as well. And by reproductive, reproductive effector, it's been shown to cause reproductive damage in females and in males. Now, here's where I want to talk a little bit more about chelating and why this chelating issue is such a big deal. So Mathilde Tissier, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Strasbourg, studied a rapidly declining population of hamsters living in a monocrop field where pesticides were sprayed on a cornfield. They said monocrop. That means GMO, folks. And that like would 99.999% chance mean GMO monocrop sprayed with glyphosate, right? We don't have proof but this is what we're asserting. When that was duplicated in a lab he, lab, he discovered that the hamster mothers developed cannibalistic behaviors and they were severely deficient in vitamin B3, this one, one particular vitamin and its precursor tryptophan. When he, they, the hamsters were administered vitamin B3, the cannibalism stopped. So what I have to ask is what if the toxins in our food supply and the subsequent lack of vitamins and minerals that are essential for our brain's development for making good decisions are one of the primary contributing factors to violence and mass shootings in America? Who is studying that? That's what I want to know. Who is testing all of these serial killers and parolees and criminals for, it's a simple blood test, folks. Do they have proper levels of vitamin B3? And now I'm not saying... I would give them a pass for doing what they're doing um, if they're low in vitamins and minerals. But if our food supply isn't supplying the appropriate vitamins and minerals because glyphosate is chelating them out, we've got to take a look at that and not just look at making more laws, you know, and, and putting more people in prison. We've got to look at what are we actually feeding people in America that might be contributing to violence. Clearly with these hamsters administering one vitamin changed altered, halted, stopped their violent behavior completely. So what did we do? We said, we've got to test and we've got to take matters into our own hands. And uh, we did that moms across America initiated the first glyphosate testing in America. I believe this was about like nine years ago now, um, because we believe testing is one of the most important actions to raise awareness about agrochemicals in our food supply. And what we found back then, just in case you're, you're not aware of these results, we want to recap them was that uh, in our drinking water, glyphosate was found three times higher than what's allowed in Europe. And that was, this was just from about 40 different tests um, that people sent in on their own dime. They paid for it themselves to get their water tested. Uh, we also found that there was uh, much higher levels of glyphosate in our children. Um, college student had 18.8 parts per billion. Just so you know, farmers usually have around nine parts per billion. She had twice that amount. My son had 8.7 parts per billion, which is that akin to a farmer. And, and that far, that my son, that particular son at that time, he was the only one of my three sons that had, was present, had glyphosate present in his urine. And, uh, and what I figured out was that he was eating wheat sprayed with glyphosate as a drying agent. My other two children had shown presented with gluten intolerances. So they were eating gluten-free and he was the only one eating gluten. So that was the only difference in their diet. And we know now that glyphosate is sprayed on wheat as a drying agent before harvest, along with peas, beans, legumes, sugar, uh, all kinds of uh, oats, all kinds of grains. And it does not wash, dry, or cook off, folks. It ends up on our food, we eat it, and then it ends up in our children's urine, and it ends up contributing to major health issues. In fact, in my son at that time, he had a sudden onset of autism symptoms. And when we went 100% organic and we treated his gut because he had gut dysbiosis, he had C. diff, all kinds of bacterial problems that his, his doctor tested him for. And when we went 100% organic and uh, we took care of his gut, we gave him um, sauerkraut and, and uh, colloidal silver and MSM bar MRM that helps coat the gut lining. And he had no sugar from Thanksgiving till, um, until New Year's, no sugar, even Santa Claus didn't bring sugar in his stocking. And because sugar feeds the bad gut bacteria, when we did that, he was then able to uh, recover. He, he, we tested him six weeks later and there was no glyphosate and no detectable glyphosate in his urine and his autism symptoms were gone. So um, detecting glyphosate in your urine is an important step to take in sorting out your health. And on momsacrossamerica.org, we do have labs, links to labs where you can do that. Now, we also found glyphosate in breast milk at levels up to 3,000 times higher than has been found to show sex hormone changes in animal studies. 
So very important to consider when, um, you, you know, if you have a loved one or a niece or a nephew or a child that has, you know, sex hormone changes going on, you know, what are they eating? Are they eating endocrine disrupting chemicals? Now I want to point out on this map, it looks like most of the women did not have uh, glyphosate in their breast milk. And that is because nine out of 10 of these women were moms across America supporters, but that was the only way we could get them to send in their breast milk and spend $45 to FedEx their frozen breast milk in with, they, they, they trusted us and they knew uh, what our intention was. Um, but uh, one of them, the one that 99 parts per billion over there says she confessed to eating out at restaurants quite a bit, not organic, eating mostly organic at home. The other one, the 76 part per billion, the same thing. And the one that had the highest levels was a friend of a Moms Across America supporter. She did not, she was not aware of us. She did not know about GMOs. And coincidentally, she had the highest levels. Now, uh, since we did that testing, there has been uh, a widespread contamination, contamination of glyphosate discovered in foods all across the board. In fact, Canada, um, thanks to the work of Tony Mitra, a very um, a smart activist in Canada, got the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to test 7,800 food samples. And um, in the US, GMO Free USA tested, uh, Detox Project tested, Democracy Now! tested, um, I believe EWG tested as well, and Washington Perg, and of course, Moms Across America. We uh, exposed that there was glyphosate in wine and beer and orange juice and hummus and eggs and dairy and um, all kinds of organizations found that there were, was glyphosate in, in children's snacks. And down at the bottom, if you can't see those white objects, that is a sanitary pad, actually. Cotton has high levels, you know, non-organic cotton. And even gauze pads used in the hospital contain glyphosate. And that's this is not a good thing, folks, because again, it it kills off the beneficial bacteria and you, you want that beneficial bacteria when you're trying to heal. So keep in mind, all of these products that we tested were non-organic. There was a few, there was one maybe organic wine that did show a tiny bit of contamination, but in general, the thousands and thousands of tests that have been done um, by mostly, mostly by, you know, um, consumer initiatives or prompted by consumer initiatives, uh, people like our moms and, and other groups, um, they, they have all shown that uh, non-organic food had thousands of times higher glyphosate than, uh, than organic food. So it's always better to eat organic. However, um, there is contamination and the detox project had show, has shown that glyphosate um, has, is you know, present in many different grocery store foods. 37 conventional foods were tested, 23 contain glyphosate, that's 62%. 26 non-GMO foods were tested. This is by the detox project, 18 tested positive and two of them had the top high, high, top five highest levels and 23 organic foods were tested and five tested positive. So that's 21%. And, um, and, and I just want to say one more thing about this that I don't have the slide to show it, but they tested, um, protein powders. And that was the only time that I've seen that the level, the contamination of glyphosate in an organic product is, was the same as the conventional and the non-GMO product. So it was 54 parts per billion of glyphosate in the conventional protein powder, 54 parts per billion of glyphosate in the non-GMO protein powder, and 54 parts per billion of glyphosate in the organic protein powder. And I don't have the exact names of that protein powder, those protein powders right now, but you can look at the detox project if you want to see more about that. And what that shows us is that that was not just contamination of the, the organic product, that was fraud, okay? That what's happening there is, is that the soy or the peas or the lentils, some one of those types of uh, legume products that is very commonly found in uh, protein powders, which is predominantly imported from Turkey and from you know, the European countries, that product likely came over the, the sea and the ship as a conventional product. And then when it arrived in Long Beach, California, it was suddenly labeled as an organic product and worth $2 million more or something like that. Right. And this has been documented to be proven to happen that they come, comes from Turkey, you know, it's conventional ends up in the United States, all of a sudden it's magically organic. And so that means it's fraudulent. So if you want to avoid contamination of organic food, the number one thing to do is avoid highly processed foods like protein powders, protein bars, um, any of the 
um, quote unquote, uh, organic, you know, um, vegan and vegetarian foods might be contaminated, right? So I would just eat whole, the, the, types, the types of foods that are very processed. So I would eat organic whole foods as much as possible in order to ensure that you're not eating contaminated organic food. Okay, so we also did some testing recently on our national school lunch uh, testing program during, you know, within this program, we tested 43 school lunch samples, thanks to our supporters and to Children's Health Defense, who also supported this project, and found 95.3% of these school lunches contained carcinogenic, endocrine disrupting, and liver disease causing glyphosate. That Now, this number is crazy high, folks, because uh, you know, what we just looked at in the, the grocery stores was that about 60% of the samples were positive. So our kids are clearly eating uh, much more uh, contaminated foods than what we're eating just in the regular grocery store. They are eating the worst of the worst food. Although we haven't tested military food yet. We haven't tested prison food yet. Um, if you know any millionaires that want to support us, we really would like to get that testing done. Uh, we also found 74% of the samples contained at least one of 29 different harmful pesticides that were detected in the food supply. Four veterinary drugs and hormones were found in nine school lunches at levels up to 130 parts per billion. And these are quite high that the, the technicians at the lab were shocked. They had never seen levels that high before in meat. This, this is veterinary drugs and hormones. And, um, and, and this is very disturbing. And later on, I think after I finish this presentation, I'll tell another story about these veterinary drugs and hormones. Um, we, we just have to know the entirety of what's going on in, in the food supply. Okay, so 100% of the school lunch samples contained heavy metals at levels up to 6,293 times higher than what the EPA allows in drinking water. Folks, that is criminal. This, this is completely unacceptable because heavy metals are proven neurotoxins, uh, and, and many of them stay in the body for the, the, the person's entire life, unless they do, you know, heavy detox chelation programs. They, they don't just easily, you know, a lot of pesticides can pass out of the body after a, a few weeks or a few days. Um, and I'm not saying they're not as harmful, but uh, heavy metals are extremely detrimental and have been linked to autism and all kinds of learning disorders and learning disabilities. So this is an absolutely an un unacceptable result to be found in our, our children's school lunches. And of course, the majority of the samples were abysmally low in nutrients. And you know, given what I just said about chelation, that where glyphosate makes the vital nutrients unavailable to any living thing it touches, this would make sense. Okay, well, um, actually, oh, here. So I do have the slide on the 54 parts per billion, billion um, you can see here, it was Garden of Life, raw organic fit powder chocolate. Uh, it is supposed to be non-GMO and organic, and yet it was found to have 54 parts per billion uh, of glyphosate and Vega chocolate, uh, sorry, Vega, yeah, chocolate nutritional shake was the one that had um, 54 parts per billion. That was non-GMO. And then also um, around actually lower levels was the was the, uh, that was non-GMO, the conventional had 50 parts per billion. So that was um, good. I can't read the name there of that one, but that was found at Target. So you can see here that there's clearly some um, major fraudulent labeling going on in, in these processed, um, processed organic and non-GMO products. Although keep in mind, non-GMO GMO is not supposed to mean no glyphosate. It's just supposed to mean tested for GMOs and it has to contain less than 0.9% of GMOs. Okay, so non-GMO is not the first label I would go for. I would go for organic and non-GMO together in most cases, except for you know protein powders like this. I would just avoid it altogether. Keep in mind that apple cider vinegar, kombucha, and sauerkraut have been shown to break down glyphosate in the soil. So I incorporate that into my, those things into my daily diet, um, incorporate, you know, apple cider vinegar and salad dressing, kombucha, that's my evening drink. And uh, sauerkraut is something that I have a couple of times a week along with food, especially along with meat to make sure that your body is able to break down and process those proteins. All right, so we also continue doing more testing. We found glyphosate in Pediasure feeding tube liquid up to, um, 1110 times higher than has been shown to destroy gut bacteria in Carusco's study. And this is terrible because of course, when a, a, a baby is suffering from cancer 
which is happening because there's so many toxins in our food supply and our water supply and pregnant mothers are contaminating their bodies with it unintentionally. Um, when this happens, it's destroying the baby's immune system right at a time when they're supposed to be fighting off cancer. So this is something that, uh, again, is, is so, um, incomprehensible that our senators and representatives and, um, regulatory agencies would allow this to happen. Now, since then, um, it, the pediatric, uh, people have, uh, developed a non-GMO, um, a non-GMO liquid, uh, you know, feeding tube liquid. Uh, but, um, I don't believe that we have since then tested it for glyphosate because I, again, I said non-GMO does not mean no glyphosate. There could still be glyphosate in there. And we would of course love to do more testing. We have done testing on five childhood vaccines that we sent in and all of them were positive for glyphosate. And now why would we send in child childhood vaccines for glyphosate um, well, if you look at the ingredients in, GM, in, in of vaccines, excuse me, you will see that many of the uh, ingredients are derived from animals that most likely eat GMOs. For instance, chicken um, serum, bovine serum, which is cattle and pig tendons make up the gelatin in uh, vaccines that are the stabilizing agent, especially for live vaccines. Uh, so the problem with this is that the glyphosate that's on the grains that the animals eat I believe I have a slide on this. Yes. Goes into, um, the pig tendons and the other animal, you know, the blood and the bone marrow and the, all of that. And especially the gelatin is ground up and made into, I mean, the pig tendons are ground up and made into gelatin and they end up in the vaccines, but you can see the vaccine ingredients listed down here on the bottom. There's a lot of, um, animal products in vaccines that are likely to be the, uh, conduit for glyphosate, their GMO ingredients. So what are the, what are the human implications of glyphosate exposure on such a systemic level? What I just showed to you is glyphosate is contaminating breast milk, urine, tap water, uh, all thousands of different kinds of foods, vaccines, right. Of sanitary, all these different bread, bread, milk, beer, wine, orange juice. Um, it's in the rain as well. You know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So what are the, what are the uh, what are the implications? Well, you probably have all heard that glyphosate causes cancer. This is uh, Lee Johnson, who was awarded $289 million by the jury. It was lowered to 80 million by the judge. I think in the end, he might've gotten 20 million, something like that, but it has helped him to be able to get cancer treatments. And from what I hear now, he is doing much better. So that is good. Uh, the pilioid couple uh, got a verdict for $2 billion dollars. I don't know how, what that was lowered to, but I'm pretty sure they didn't get $2 billion, but they, they did get awarded that because both of them got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup and uh, Bayer will pay out over 12 billion to over 144,000 plaintiffs. Now, one in eight Americans have now, now have liver disease. And that's what uh, one of these studies by Rob, Rob, Robin, um, Robin Massange and uh, Sarah Lini and the, Michael Antonou and George Rennie and this team, Malcolm Ward, all showed that uh, glyphosate, when you know administered to rats at ultra low doses, revealed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in those rats. So it caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in those rats at levels, I think there are like four parts per billion per, per kilogram of body weight, which is definitely uh, lower than what we humans are consuming uh, per kilogram of body weight. And you can see in this chart, the astronomical surge of uh, the blue line is the GMO corn and soy crops planted. Um, and the red line is glyphosate applied to the corn. And you can see the pre-1990 trend of liver disease. And then you can see the liver cancer incidence an increase um, exponentially along with the increase of G glyphosate applied to the, to the corn. And, and these, these are from Nancy Swanson and Stephanie Seneff, uh, you know, interpreted them. And so this is about thyroid disorder. You can see that there's of course, a very close correlation of, of, a uh, thyroid disorder being caused by glyphosate. And there are scientific studies too, that show that that's actually what is happening. And there's also a maternal exposure to um, glyphosate that's leading to autism in rats or autism-like symptoms is what they're showing. 
And the core, the relation to this, the, the correlation to this, the closeness of the correlation to this is closer is, than that of smoking and lung cancer. Okay. So this is, and, and it's been shown in studies to, to, to contribute to autism and, we, autism. and we have hundreds, if not thousands of mothers that have reported to us that when they get their kids switched over to organic, their autism symptoms uh, decrease or greatly improve. Uh, such as I showed in my son as well. So we see it across the board. Now, what I'm also very concerned about is that glyphosate is sterilizing men and androgenase and, you know, making our, our female babies and andro- more androgynous. There's a new study out by Dr. Shauna, Shauna Swan that shows that glyphosate exposure in utero caused an androgenization or a masculinization of the baby girl genital area. That means a lengthening between the anus and the genitals got longer, which is a masculine trait and goodness knows what else it's doing to them physiologically, you know, in their biology and in their brain waves and their, their sexual organs. Um, you know, we simply don't know enough about that yet, but I believe that this chemical is contributing to the, um, confusion this, you know, the sexual reproduction, uh, deformities and, um, uh, lack of function the way they normally do, uh, sex hormone drives has dropped considerably. Um, and also, you know, I believe it may be contributing to, uh, gender confusion and, uh, problems there, which lead to depression. And 50% of the children that are transgender do attempt suicide. And that to me is the most tragic, one of the most tragic things I've ever heard because every human life is prejudice is precious. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. Um, we should not be thinking that we need to end our lives because of that. And so I would just ask everybody to have compassion for people who are, um, you know, experiencing this, uh, challenge or for family members that are condemning a person who is going through that, please consider that we're consuming probably 1200 different endocrine disrupting chemicals in our society. Now that was not happening 40 years ago. Okay. Um, also want to point out again, the sperm viability has dropped 49% since the glyphosate was introduced into our food supply. And, um, and, and that is a major problem in, you know, uh, male reproductive systems, their testosterone levels, all of that. So, uh, yes. So glyphosate herbicides, there's many studies now showing that male reproductive damage, female reproductive damage, um, the blood testes barrier, uh, is impacted by glyphosate. And, uh, you know, what I, what I ask in the bottom of this slide is, you know, the EPA has added so many endangered species to the list, uh, since glyphosate has been introduced. It's just, just, I don't know, hundreds of species. We, we are in a pair that we have had like a 75% loss of our insect population just in the past, uh, 20 or 30 years since glyphosate was in, in being introduced. I'm concerned we're going to be adding the human beings to the endangered species list. If we keep going in this direction, I am very concerned that we will not be able to procreate naturally. And then the only people who will be able to procreate will be the people who can afford in vitro fertilization. And that those people will only be the highest, most elite, wealthiest people in the country, um, who uh, many of them who are getting wealthy um, off the sickness of other people that are perpetuating the problem. So, um, and there's more evidence that glyphosate is, is a reproductive uh, danger because it has shortened the gestations contributing to miscarriages um, and development delays and infant deaths. And uh, this is from a study on 71 different um, pregnant women in Iowa that, that lived close to the, um, the, you know, the farms that spray glyphosate and they showed a definite, a significant shortened gestational link um, in this in this, um, sorry, this one's, this slide says, okay. One says I, one says Indiana. I'll, I'll make sure to correct that. Okay. So glyphosate, um, also disrupts the gut microbiome, weakening the immune system. I think I mentioned this before, but I just wanted to show you, there are studies showing that it does this in, in bees and poultry and in humans. And, um, and this is again, no joke because weakening the immune system is what of course led to the shutdowns all across America with, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses being closed. I believe it was 40% of black owned businesses disappeared during COVID. That is tragic. Um, any business being shut down is tragic and, um, you know, kids being locked up, locked up at home and not 
able to go to school and their development, developmental abilities dropped. Um, and, and, you know, this is all, I believe, due to the fact that we've been exposing ourselves to glyphosate so long and weakening our immune systems that the American people had far more severe reactions to COVID than people, for instance, in Japan, if you look at their numbers, um, their, their numbers were far less uh, for, from COVID. So, okay, so I know I've talked quite a bit now about all the bad stuff that's going on in the food supply, but maybe not all of it. I just covered some of it. But um, what can we do? Well, we can grow, buy, and eat organic. That is for sure. As I said before, it's very little uh, of very few um, organic products are testing positive for glyphosate. And when they do, it's usually very low, just avoid the highly processed ones. So if you buy organic, you are definitely exposing yourself to fewer pesticides and and lower quantities of glyphosate for sure. And so we do continue to urge you to do that. Now, for me, it doesn't have to be USDA organic. Um, I also love uh, the Real Organic Project, Regenerative Organic Certified, Demeter, Biodynamic, um, and just knowing your farmer. I, I Frankly, I buy a lot of my uh, produce at the local farmer's market in the summertime if I'm not growing my own. Last Actually, last summer, I hardly had to buy any food from the farmer's market because I was growing so much of it myself. And um, and, uh, but I, and I do get my meat from a farmer that I personally know is not giving his cattle the MRNA vaccine or any other vaccine and is not feeding them GMOs or glyphosate or anything like that. So that's uh, how I predominantly purchase my food as I know my farmer. Now we, we, when we go to switch to organic, um, it has been proven to dramatically reduce the amount of pesticides that we are exposing ourselves to. Charles Benbrook showed from his Heartland Health Research Alliance that the majority of the consumption of pesticides are consumed through conventional fruits and vegetables. And, um, and just by switching to organic, you can reduce your, your in con consumption of pesticides by 98%. So what this also shows me is that if nutritionists and doctors are telling their patients to eat more fruits and vegetables, but they're not saying eat organic, then they're actually going to be encouraging them to expose themselves to more pesticides, right. Than they normally would be to 98% more, in fact, pesticides. So any healthcare practitioners out there, I charge you with saying, eat more organic fruits and vegetables, because if you don't, you are contributing to the problem. And I, I, frankly, I almost cried recently when my functional medicine doctor um, prescribed to me a you know whole litany of I got tests done, genetic testing, metabolic testing done, um, you know sorting out some of my health issues that are going on. And uh, at the bottom of the thing, it said, "Eat organic as much as possible." And I just almost cried because I was like, "This is what I've been looking for for over a decade now, and finally doctors are doing this." So I, I highly recommend functional medicine doctors. Now, on your own, if you want to start avoiding glyphosate, you know, just from what I just said. Here's the top 10 foods with high, the highest residue levels of glyphosate, oats, wheat, and chickpeas. Now, in some cases, chickpeas were the highest. I just want to re reiterate that. But in one group that we found oats was the highest, then wheat, and then chickpeas, mung beans were very high, lentils, buckwheat, um, you know, all just different kinds of grains, eggs, uh, dairy, and soy. And these are non-organic, okay, non-organic crops. And, um, but when, again, when you do go organic, you can see that your glyphosate pesticide side levels will drop dramatically within six days on an organic diet. And I believe, um, it went down to hundred percent in a different Norwegian study in two weeks by going on an organic diet. So it does work folks by going organic. And here's some information about where you can get tested. We also have this on our website, momsacrossamerica.org under data, it says get tested. And we have the labs, the Health Research Institute, Laboratories, Detox Project, Great Plains Lab, and Million Markers tests for PFOS, phthalates, and parabens as well. Now, Moms Across America has been raising awareness about this for 11 years now. And in the first, I believe, five years, there were many groups that joined into Fourth of July parades. And we raised, we raised awareness with thousands locally and millions nationally in a single day by joining into Fourth of July parades. And by having that word GMOs on that banner, we just got, you know, grandpa to elbow his wife and say, Molly, what's, what's a GMO? And she would say, I don't know, look it up, you know, and they would look it up and they would learn what GMOs are and learn that they've been in our food supply for 20 years at that point uh, without labeling. 
And uh, so we, I'm very proud of what we've done. Our moms, it was a 600 leaders all across the country that caused over a thousand events, started a thousand events in all 50 states. And um, we've had our social media person said just in the past, I think four or five years, we've had 78 million impressions just on social media. And so we estimate 100 million impressions over the past 11 years, because for the first couple of years, I couldn't afford to pay a social media person. So, um, but we, you know, we were reaching even more people back then. Uh, we were reaching 300,000 people a week. And since when I started the website in February, by June, we were reaching 300,000 people a week on Facebook with only 3,000 likes. So now we have 70,000 likes because that's been plateaued, right? It's been at 70,000 for a couple of years now because Facebook doesn't like what we talk about. So um, it should be, you know, millions now, but um, we're being censored. So we highly encourage you to go to Moms Across America's Facebook page and not only like it, but comment on it and share it. Okay. That improves the uh, algorithms. So we are making progress. Non-GMO and organic food purchases are skyrocketing across America. Uh, Non-GMO Project Verified label exceeds $19 billion. 82% of U.S. households now buy some organic food regularly. That was according to the Organic Trade Association back in 2018. And the organic market is growing three times faster than conventional. And and back in 2000, I guess the stat is also from 2018, $52 billion a year. And the fact is, is that organic farmers make more money and consumers spend less money on healthcare when they purchase organic. So it is a win-win all the way around. And there are bills being formulated to, to, um, well, sorry, that's an old, that's an older side. Um, the bills were formulated to label GMOs and they, they did not work. Okay. So that's why we have to educate each other about organic and the benefits so that we can make choices. Um, and when we do make those choices of purchasing organic, it does send a message to the market and general mills is no longer allows their farmers and their sustainability program to use glyphosate based herbicides as a drying agent or otherwise known as a desiccant. So that's progress. There's an oats mill in Canada that no longer accepts glyphosate sprayed oats. There's a barley mill in Australia that segregates sprayed and non-sprayed barley. That's because the beer makers want to have non-sprayed barley so that they can ferment their beer properly. If there's too much glyphosate in there, the bacteria doesn't grow and it doesn't ferment properly. Um, Also, Canadian wheat growers promote the Keep It Clean program. So that is huge. And that happened because there were a bunch of Italian grandmas that said, we do not want to feed our children um, wheat sprayed with glyphosate in our schools. So they fought it and would not, you know, import wheat into Italy from Canada if it had been sprayed with glyphosate. So the, the Canadian Wheat Growers Association decided to do a keep it clean campaign and educate their farmers about not spraying glyphosate on wheat. So as to protect the economy of the Canadian, um, you know, the, enti- the, the entire uh, country of Canada. That's one of their biggest exports. So another thing we can do is cur- encourage eating regenerative organic food. There are some, there are some, um, wonderful cereal companies that are now, um, promoting regenerative organic Cascadia is one of them. Um, there's a few others. I'm sorry. I'm not remembering all, all of them right now, but if you look in the cereal aisle and you look for regenerative organic, there are a few cereal plant brands that are actually promoting regenerative organic. So please do do that because farmers soil wildlife and consumers benefit when they phase out GMO monocrops and agricultures and switch to biodiverse regenerative organic instead. Okay. And so the, you know, the summary is that the current food supply is poisoning us. It's making us sterile. It's increasingly short supply. It's dependent on distant foreign sources. It's not regulated for safety. Um, In fact, uh, during uh, the last administration, during Trump administration, he decided that GMO regulators do not have to um, regulate themselves. They, I mean, sorry, do not have to be regulated by the U.S. government. They can regulate themselves. So we don't actually have GMO regulation going on right now and the prices are going up and the government controls distribution of baby formula uh, as well. So we, we think we should control it. So I'm sorry, I have a little bit longer. I'm going to go through just a little bit more of the solution. Um, but so we, what we're seeing is that consumer actions are effective, but government policy is taking way too long. So it's time to take matters in our own hands. We encourage you to support the Moms Across America monthly food testing programs. And, um, and these are some of the things that we want to test children's uh, hospital food, military food, fast food, gluten-free food, and also support the neighborhood food network by joining in. This is another program that we started 
This is part of the solution where we invite, inspire, and excite our neighbors to grow food and source food locally to create community health and preparedness one street at a time. And it works by starting a neighborhood food network in your neighborhood, just inviting people over for a block party or for you know Saturday morning coffee and, and bagels and talking about growing food on your street. And by that, I mean backyard and front yard. I don't mean a community garden. I mean on your street so that if the power shuts down or if there's some type of crisis, you have access to food on your street. And we have Monday night free coaching calls with Q&A with experts at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time to support you in that. We have resources for planning, planting, pest control, and preserving, and for having those local meetings on your street. And we have flyer data and flyers data in action. We have all kinds of planning sources on our website on the Neighborhood Food Network. Please go there, find out your garden zone, find out when you're supposed to plant what. Uh, here's tools and tips tips and techniques. This is the harvest tracker that we have. You can see how much money you're saving. If you like to get into data like that, this is my favorite. This is the monthly planting reminders by zone. So each zone that you're in, you can find out what zone you're on on our website. Uh, then you can click on it and add it to add a reminder to your Google or Outlook calendars. And so every month on that first day of the month, as you can see an example here, it'll tell you what seeds to start planting and what, what you can be harvesting at that time. So the benefits of the food neighbor, neighborhood food network are bringing to med, together community, bridging the pl political divide, um, increasing your health because you're avoiding GMOs and toxic chemicals, and you're also eating food that's fresh, which has high, way higher compounds that fight cancer and uh, protect your immune system when you eat food fresh that you've just picked. Uh, you're also becoming more prepared if there was a crisis, you and your neighbors would have access to food and reducing violence because the, here's the thing, it only takes nine missed meals for a person to resort to violence to feed their family. And with this program, your neighbors become partners in a time of crisis instead of a threat to each other. And I think that is a very good thing. Also, you're building financial resilience. Your survival, we believe, should not be dependent on the decisions made on Wall Street but on the decisions made on your street. So we say it's time to get street fed, right? And join and invest in the Neighborhood Food Network, which has numerous uh, benefits, including, you know, a new sense of connection is the thing that I love the most, excitement and fun. Um, there's Carol uh, Grave in the Plateau Neighborhood Food Network. She, I think, has like 96 members now. And um, and they, she said she's it's the best thing she's ever done in her community. She's getting together with her, with her community members and learning how to, you know, uh, can peaches. She's shared raspberry bushes. They've shared apples. They've shared a squash there. She's connecting with her neighbors and her in community in ways that has never happened before because of the neighborhood food network. So we really urge you to sign up and create one in your area too. You can also support local CSAs. If you go to lo localharvest.org and get your food from your local community supported agriculture system. There's so many benefits. Uh, you can screenshot this and come back to this later if you want, um, but there's over 4,000 listed on their grassroots database. So you can definitely start purchasing your food from a farmer that you know, um, most likely in an area near you. You can also go onto the Farmish app. This is a very smart woman who just, she does TikToks all day long about growing and buying and selling and bartering homegrown food. She's fabulous. And I highly suggest you check out that app. That app, the website is actually called Get Farmish, um, but the the app itself on your phone is called Farmish. And there's also Farm Match. It's the same type of concept, except this is um, mostly focusing on farms, not just on backyard backyard grow, growers. The Farmish app is mostly on backyard growers and homesteaders. This is more on small farms. And the Weston A. Price Foundation also is a great resource for local foods and um, also local meats, like uh, you know people who sell half a pig or half a cow or things like that, so um, or raw milk. And you can also learn how to grow more food by joining into the worldwide organic opportunities. Uh, sorry, worldwide opportunities on organic farms program. I think it's like forty dollars a month, and you get access to all kinds of farms all across the country and around the world that will welcome complete strangers to come stay on their farm, either park an RV or sometimes stay in a tent or stay in the, in a house. Sometimes they have a room for them and uh, you can stay two weeks. You could stay two months. You could stay a year in some cases and work on the far farm four hours a day. And I believe they give you two meals a day 
And uh, so you get exchange free, free room and board for, uh, for, uh, you know, four hours or so of work. And uh, it's a fabulous way to learn how to grow and harvest food. We, I think we harvested over 2000 cloves of garlic at, in a couple of different farms. One farm we harvested, another farm we washed it and hung it to dry. And then another farm we clipped the ends off because they were already dried. And um, so we had a very intimate relationship with garlic that summer. It was fantastic. So here's some resources. And all of these resources are going to support you in creating a parallel food system from the current food system that we have. Opting out of big pharma and big tech and big ag is such a good idea right now. It's really the best thing that you can do. And you can mostly do that by connecting with your local communities. And so I urge you to contact us to invest in the Neighborhood Food Network, invest in Moms Across America, get my book. It's called Unstoppable. Uh, sorry, the only place it's available right now is on Amazon, but um, that's the only reason why I would encourage you to go there. Uh, please get my book and share it with your friends or family. Give a, give a copy to your library. And I just want to say thank you very much. And uh, please check out Moms Across America. Sign up for our newsletter and sign up for our, um, our newsletter on Moms Across America and on the Neighborhood Food Network as well. Great. Thank you so much for that very, uh, very uh, informational presentation, Zen. Thank you. So, so now we're going to begin our live Q&A session. I'll be asking some questions as well as opening up to the audience. Um, you went over all of your, uh, all of the uh, the ways to contact you and where to get your books. So that's, that's great. Um, before uh, we begin the Q&A, I just want to go over a few things so everybody understands the process. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is click on the reactions button on, toward the second to the right on the bottom of Zoom. Then click on the raise hand function in the menu that pops up. We'll take questions in the order in which they are received. When it's your turn, we will unmute you and ask you to state where you're from and your, ask your question. When, when we, when you've asked your question, um, then I, I will mute you. And we ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. In order to give everyone a chance, um, we won't be taking follow-up questions. However, if you do wish to ask another question, you can just raise your hand again. And if we have time, then um, then we will get to you. So I see that we have some folks that are raising their hands already. So I will start off with Cheryl. Cheryl, please state where you're from and ask your question. I'm from Santa Rosa, California. Hi, Zen. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. We're all so lucky to have you in the world. Oh, and thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. And my question is about the Prop 65 toxin warning that's on foods in California. And it's been, frankly, hard for me to figure out why it's on a lot of organic, fair trade, single ingredient items, but not on highly processed foods that are loaded with GMOs. For example, it's on my organic matcha green tea powder, and it's on foods alive nutritional yeast. And for a while, it was on my raw organic cacao nibs. And then it disappeared from that. And then for a while in California, it was on all the shells that had organic balsamic vinegar. And now it's not there anymore. And when I asked someone about that at the Whole Foods Market, like, why is it on my raw cacao nibs, but not on the processed foods with a million ingredients that include chocolate? Mm -hmm. The person said it was political. <laughs> and so... Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, do you personally pay attention to those? Don't you live in California? I think I, I did live in California. I left California predominantly because of the vaccine laws and because I wanted to grow my own food. And so I've moved to uh, Western North Carolina. I live in the Asheville area now. Um, but I know, okay, I, I can't say I know exactly why that's happening, but I have an insight to why that's happening because I was approached by a man who runs a company. Um, it was some type of environmental health company. And what he does is he sues, he tests uh, foods like chocolates, uh, chocolate foods and uh, protein powders and supplements specifically for the ingredients that are listed on the Prop 65 list so that he can sue them and get money from them. And then uh, they are then required 
to not sell that product in California, but then they can go ahead and sell that product everywhere else across the United States and still continue poisoning everybody. And what he predominantly um, would test for was heavy metals. So it is my guess that that chocolate is likely, um, and those products have heavy metal levels that are uh, unacceptable for California's, uh, um, you know, laws. And California is stricter than um, than the federal government. And uh, and you're saying no, Prop, Prop 65 also has to do with what's in the packaging. Yes, it can. It, the Prop 65, um, pa- it can um, be related to the packaging, but it can also be related to the ingredients that are in the food. And this man in particular was testing for what was in the food or in the supplement. Um, but the packaging can also, yeah, can contain plastics or parabens or your, you know, things like that. But it would have to say that on the label that this packaging, right, it violates Prop 65 laws. Um, and, and it, when you when you're when you're at a restaurant in California, it will say some of the ingredients in the food here um, you know, violate Prop 65. And and what that means is that the Prop 65 is it's it, it is it really is a a good thing that somebody is actually paying attention to what's going on in the food supply. And I've met many people at OEHA, the office of health hazard and assessment, and uh, they really are looking at it very closely. It's, it's, I mean, they've been sued by Monsanto. They are, you know, working pretty hard to, to, you know, make sure that the, that we don't consume harmful chemicals. And so that means that those chemicals are either carcinogenic or they're endocrine disrupting. I don't think they have to determine uh, which one the chemical is and, you know, which one it is, whether it's a cancer carcinogenic or endocrine, endocrine disrupting, but those are the two categories that they look at. They don't look at nerve damage or, you know, like nervous system damage or, um, you know, other types of, uh, damage. They, they look at just those two can, uh, cancer causing and endocrine disruption. So something is going on with those foods. And I, my guess would be, uh, the heavy metals, although, uh, Lee, 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 Lilani, Lilani Booker says that, you know, it, it could have to do with the packaging, which is an excellent point as well. Great. Thank you for that answer, Zen. Our next question is coming from Stephen. Stephen, please state where you're from and ask your question. I'm from Buffalo, New York, and I appreciate the presentation. And I just want you to repeat the name of the organization where you can go f- f- stay at a farm. Oh, thank you. Yes, Stephen. So it's the Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. So it's called WOOF, W-W-O-O-F. And you go to that website and pay like a $40 membership fee, I think. And you can find places around the world. It's so exciting. I, I really would like to do that with my sons. I don't know, maybe this summer or next summer. There's actually a place in Thailand where you can go to in Chiang Mai and you can uh, work on an organic farm and they will teach you how to cook Thai food, which is delicious. And they'll also teach you how to train elephants. They have elephants that, you know, help out with the, I don't know, moving logs around or whatever they do there. And so there, you know, but and we just did this in the United States. We stayed on organic farms. We harvested garlic. We harvested kale. We worked with, uh, there were some religious communities that we visited. So it was a very good experience for our kids to see different types of religious communities. Um, there's there's uh, people who have homes that you can stay in or you can stay in an RV. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I worked alongside people from Korea on a farm, you know, uh, harvesting garlic. Uh, there was somebody there from somewhere in Europe. There were, you know, community members, people from around the world that were helping out and supporting farmers. And I just think that's a beautiful thing. So I I highly encourage you to do that. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is coming from Marley. Marley, please state where you're from and ask your question. Yes. Good afternoon, Zen. My name is Marley and I am from Hollywood, South Florida. And just a quick side note, I love your art behind you. Love to hear us. But thank you. That's my my art. (laughs) What is it? It's my art. It's beautiful. Oh, it's thank absolutely you. beautiful. Thank you. But my question is, I'm very interested in growing my own vegetables with the community. And I, I know you kind of reviewed a few of the resources, but what would you recommend is the easiest way to start with somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience with growing their own vegetables? Oh, that's great. Well, 
uh, Ann Temple, my, my cohort and co-founder of Neighborhood Food Network. Oh, she's on here right now. That's great. Hi, Ann. She'll, she'll probably post the link to the Neighborhood Food Network. And, um, and on the Neighborhood Food Network, we have a blog and we have a lot of tips and planning. I, I would say, I mean, if, if you want to be really basic, you can just, you can get pots and you can start growing tomatoes in pots, that kind of thing. Like cherry tomatoes are delicious and uh, very rewarding to grow cherry tomatoes in pots. But if you do have a bit of land, um, I would encourage that you do, um, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a raised bed. You can just get some mulch or some, you know, soil, make sure that, or if you have good soil, you'd have, you want it, you want it to be kind of loomy soil, you know, not hard clay. It's, de it's difficult to start growing in that, but just grow your favorite vegetables, grow and grow things that are more prolific. Like I would not start with carrots uh, because they're so, they're kind of hard to sprout and uh, cauliflower and broccoli and things like that because they have uh, cabbage moths that come and they, they're more difficult. I would start with zucchini and yellow squash. Spinach will grow all, like Malabar spinach will grow all season long. And you, it's just wonderful to have a source of spinach that you can grab handfuls and put it in your smoothie in the morning. Kale is also very easy to grow. Uh, lettuce is very easy to grow, but be mindful not to plant too much lettuce because then you will have, you can't preserve lettuce, right? You will, or you just go ahead and grow a lot and then you can share it with your neighbors. So uh, those are, those are some of the crops and tomatoes of course are, amazing, but you do, you do need to start them early if you want to grow from seeds. So at this point, I would just buy some tomato starts from people and watch a little video that we have on a neighborhood food network. I believe we have a video about how to plant tomatoes. You have to plant them deep in the ground and um, give them an eggshell and Epsom salts, some things like that. But once you start growing, I'm telling you, you're not going to go back. It's just the most delicious food you've ever had in your life. It's so flavorful and you feel so proud of yourself and it's so wonderful to share the food that you've grown. Um, and if you have kids, you're, you know, teaching them and they feel proud of themselves and accomplished. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. Thank you for that, Zen. Mm -hmm. so, um, how do you respond to, to arguments that uh, GMOs are safe and, and, you know, people who kind of poo poo the whole idea, how, how do you communicate with that? How do you uh, open up people's eyes to, to the fact that, uh, you know, that, this really is an issue. And, you know, this audience is very, you know, friendly to, to your message. How do you, how do you go about speaking to people on that? Especially when they say that this is necessary to, to grow enough food for the, for the world population. Yes, that's a, that's a great point. I have gotten that from many people. One of my classmates used to work at Pepsi, um, you know, one of my high school class classmates. And when we reconnected, he had those very same questions. And I said, well, I understand that that's what the public is being told that GMOs are being grown uh, for a noble intention to feed the world. Um, but the fact is, if you look historically at the world, look at China and India, they have the largest populations in the world, you know, for, and they've been around for 5,000 years, documented 5,000 years, you know, growing food, agriculture systems, and they have not used GMOs or, or glyphosate. And then one might even say that they are that large because they ate organic food, right? And so if you look at it, GMOs and glyphosate and these toxic chemicals have only been around for the past 40, 50 years. They're a new technology that's actually destroying our immune systems. And I would just encourage them to look at the science. If you go to Moms Across America and you look at our data, you can see that there are numerous studies showing that GMOs um, actually do not, they may increase yield for the first year or two, um, but they don't increase... Um, you know, nutrition, they don't increase taste. And then they actually decline the yield declines and they're, they're less, they grow, uh, produce less than organic crops. And they deplete the soil in such a way that other crops can't grow. And then that farmer becomes dependent, becomes actually a slave to the chemical system of fertilization and also chemicals that, uh, you know, destroy the, the bugs and the weeds of the flora and the fauna. And so um, I would assert that there have been promises made by GMO producers that are not being fulfilled. And I would invite them to look closer at the science of what is actually um, being shown to, to be produced and, and how it's actually working. And, it, and you, can, you can just look at the most recent GMO um, uh, projects and pink pineapple, who needs pink pineapples? right? Apples that don't brown, who cares? Just eat the apple. 
right? You know, and potatoes that don't brown, you know what that means? It doesn't mean that they're not rotting. They're still rotting and you will still smell them as rotten potatoes. You just don't see the browning. So then that allows the restaurant owners to cut up those potatoes and make them into French fries or mashed potatoes. And you, you don't know it. So the things that they're coming out with are things that they're trying to appeal to consumer, uh, you know, like, oh, it has more vitamin A. Well, oh, you've got to eat 27 cups of that rice to have enough vitamin A for your body. You know what I mean? Something like that. It's it, what they're producing is not useful to us. I don't want salmon that's genetically engineered to grow four times fatter, four times faster and be sterile. I don't want, I don't want a GMO 2.0 that's um, CRISPR genetically engineered that has thousands of off target mutations. I've got, I've got inappropriate media and school and sports to worry about with my kids. I don't need to worry about food that has um, that causes off thousands of off target mutations or contains pesticides or is, you know, coated with herbicides. Those three factors are not interesting to me as a mother or appealing to me um, to feed my children. And what are off target mutations? Off-target mutations are caused by CRISPR and gene editing. It's when they go in and they just snip one part of a DNA and then put something back in to make it go. But, you know, it's kind of like they take out a Lego and they put in a Lego, um, but the, and they think it's just going to stay there, but it doesn't. It causes like a drop of oil in a pond. It, it is rippling effect. It affects everything around it. And so there are proven thousands of off-target mutations, changes that happen within the plant that were unintended, right? Other than that one target that they wanted to change. And so we don't know what those other, um, you know, changes are. And I don't want to have to worry about that in my food supply. So um, I, I, you know, I want not, I don't want just GMOs labeled. I don't want them in the food supply. I don't think they're safe. And there's no evidence to prove that they're safe. There's only evidence to prove that they wreak havoc on the food supply and the environment and our bodies. And uh, yeah, they may make some of the uh, producers more money. They charge 375% more for some of the seeds. They make them more money, but they haven't been proven safe. And, and I'm, I'm not interested in eating them. I see in the chat is that people are talking about appeal. This is a new coating that is being put um, on avocados and limes and lemons and oranges. And we have an article on it in Moms Across America Dot com. Thank you, Anne, for putting that up there. So if you're if you're interested in knowing what you eat, you've got to you've, you've got to watch things like this. You've got to share things like the real truth about health with your friends and family. If you you want to be healthy, we've got to educate ourselves because uh, in the most cases, the manufacturers don't even have to tell us what's going on. What is appeal, and how does that uh, how does that harm us assuming that it does. So it's, it's a coating on avocados and fruits and lemons and things like that, that, um, is that it's dubious in nature. As far as the ingredients, they're, they're actually being very unclear about some of the ingredients. They're not being specific about it. And, um, there's a lot of people that are skeptical about how it could impact humans. And you'd have to go to the article and check out all the, the details on that. Yeah. It's just, it, it, and it should say a P A P E E L it should, there should be a sticker on the product saying that it's, you know, coded and it's supposed to prevent it from rotting and it's supposed to preserve it, you know, uh, so that it doesn't rot. And that, again, that's a profit thing, right. That is that they want to be able to profit from the food that fruits and vegetables. Thank you. Yeah. So um, you, you mentioned a little bit in your presentation about some of the foods that are genetically modified. You mentioned corn. What, what are the other foods that that um, we should just assume that are genetically modified? And which ones um, does it look like are going to become genetically modified in the future? So the most common ones are corn, soy, canola, and sugar beets. And um, and sugar, most people usually think is sugar cane. But in the United States, pretty much 100% of the sugar products um, that we are, the sugar that we use is from sugar beets, and they are genetically modified to withstand glyphosate. And so those canola crops, the corn and the soy, also cotton is very highly sprayed, um, but you, and you, there is cottonseed oil in, you know, in some uh, food products, processed food products. So those are the ones that are most concerning, but as I showed in the first slide there, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, crooked neck squash, there's papaya, per, per, the majority of the papaya in Hawaii is GMO and, um, apples, potatoes, pineapples. Now there's some mushrooms, I believe CRISPR mushrooms 
there's crisper soy. Um, and, and of course they, they won't be labeled whether or not they're GMO or not, it, it, unless you see a label that says organic, organic means no GMOs or the GMOs are not allowed. And, um, of course, non-GMO means it's been tested. Organic hasn't been tested. They just don't allow GMOs. Non-GMO means that they've actually tested and made sure that less than 0.9% of the ingredients of that product are GMO. So non-GMO and organic is, is best together, right? Um, if you're, if you're going to be buying, especially processed foods. And so, yeah, you can look for cane sugar on the label, um, versus the sugar beets, but if you're going to use cane sugar, I would urge you to make sure that it's organic because cane sugar can be sprayed with glyphosate as a drying agent. And then you may have high levels of glyphosate on the cane sugar. So you want to make sure, I mean, pretty much everything is organic as much as possible. And are there other foods that they, that they finish off the, the crops with, uh, with glyphosate? I've heard chickpeas, for example. Yes. Chickpeas, beans, legumes, wheat, did that list that I had of the 10 highest foods with glyphosate, all, all of those ones are the majority of them, except eggs was on there. And of course they don't spray it on eggs. It's, it's getting on getting into eggs at high, higher levels than what the FDA allows, which are very high levels. Um, and it's getting into the eggs because the chickens eat grain sprayed with glyphosate. And I know a mom's across America supporter whose husband is a truck driver and he had to get a hazmat license because he was transporting chicken feed and chicken feed is considered a hazardous substance because of the high, the high levels of, of chemicals. So I never eat chicken out, you know, unless I know it's from an organic pasture raised uh, farm. And uh, because what happens is when those chickens are eating those high levels of glyphosate, remember we talked about destroying the, the beneficial gut bacteria and all of that, well, they develop a resistance, an antibiotic resistance and so when they're given antibiotics because they're sick, because they're in these factory farm conditions and they're squashed together and they're all getting sick, they're given antibiotics. Well, these, these MRSA, you know, um, bacteria that they grow are resistant to the antibiotics. And so then Mercola published an article showing that, um, I think it's 80 or 90% of the bacteria that contributes to UTIs, uh, comes from chicken. And that's exactly what happened to me one time. I thought I was being healthy. I was in a airport. I was traveling and I was like, okay, once in a while, I'm just going to not eat organic and I ate a chicken Caesar salad. And within a couple of weeks, I had the worst UTI of my entire life. It lasted probably for close to three months because I refused to take antibiotics until my husband like begged me to do that because I was crying at two o'clock in the morning. And um, I did, and I took a fluoroquinine antibiotic because at the time I didn't realize that that was a major problem. And six months later, I had a torn tendon in my shoulder. That's what it causes. And then uh, six months after that, the other tendon in my other shoulder tore. I was in chronic pain for a year and a half because fluoroquinine antibiotics can cause torn tendons in the shoulder and or the Achilles heel. And I believe it all goes back to that GMO chicken salad that I ate. And because uh, there was no reason for me to have any torn tendon issues at all. I was fit, healthy. I wasn't playing badminton when it happened. Um, it was just, you know, some random thing. And so, and, and it ha that, that happens to thousands and thousands of people every year. It's called being floxed, F-L-O-U-X-X-E-D. The fluoroquinines are, are a major problem. And thank you for that. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to hear. So the, uh, Okay. You mentioned glyphosate as kind of the, the, that was kind of the main part of your presentation. What are the pesticides, pharmaceutical drugs, heavy metals, veterinary drugs are in our food supply. And then because it's going into the animals and it's getting into our environment and has the FDA and the USA um, tested that kind of stuff and taken any of it off the market? Yeah. So uh, thank you for mentioning veterinary drugs again. I want to um, touch on that and then I'll talk more about pesticides. So um, the veterinary drugs that are going into these animals are, are causing them to, some of them are causing them to lactate more, right? They want the cows to make more milk, which is ridiculous because they're dumping milk across the country. I know farmers that say that when the, when the, they come to collect the milk, there's two trucks that come a week and they fill up these giant trucks, you know, of milk and they dump one of them every week. They just dump the milk out because there's too much milk in America and they're overproducing. But anyway, some of these farmers, they just want to make more money. So they inject their cows with veterinary drugs that cause the, the cows to lactate and produce more milk and they get paid more, right? They don't care whether they get that it's used or not. They just get paid more. And, um, and the, there was a, 
a nursery school friend of mine. I've known her my entire life. She is a school counselor in a high school. And she told me, Zen, these kids are SOL. Like they're in so much trouble. Uh, they have so many mental health issues. She's in, you know, in high school, they come in to talk to her as a school counselor. She said one girl came in who uh, was crying because she lactated in the shower that morning, a 15 year old girl started producing milk. She's like, what is wrong with me? Why is this happening? I'm not pregnant. I'm not on birth control. Like what is happening? And she did not know. She's like her, just your hormones are just messed up. Well, why do we think her hormones are messed up? Probably because she's eating school lunch food that's pumped full of veterinary drugs at really high levels that cause lactation. That's my assertion. We are, we are inundating our kids with endocrine disrupting chemicals that's causing their bodies to react in ways that we have never seen before. That, that is not normal. Imagine now, imagine how is she thinking? How is she able to cope in school? How are, are her relationships with people? If her hormones are going crazy like that, right? How is she thinking about herself? How, what, how are we impacting the future of America when we're inundating our kids with chemicals like this? They're not able to think properly and focus on school and learn and, and create like some, you know, amazing new invention or something like that. If they're crying because their hormones are going crazy, right? It's really a major impact on America and it's, it's got to be stopped. We have got to have healthier school lunches. We've got to have a healthier food supply. This is, this is a, this is a major epidemic in America. Not, and I'm not even talking about the autism ep 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 epidemic and all of that, which is, you know, directly linked to glyphosate and all the problems, but it's all comes back to, yes, a whole myriad of pesticides. And one thing I want people to know about regarding pesticides, I can't even name them all, right? There's, there's thousands of of different kinds of pesticides in hundreds of formulations. And um, the one thing you have to know is they don't test the final formulation for safety. They, the EPA only requires that the, the pesticide companies submit testing, short-term testing on one ingredient in that formulation. And that's what they did with, with Roundup. They, they chose glyphosate because it's not acutely toxic. It is long-term harmful, right? It's not acutely, the more, the other ingredients in Roundup are a thousand times more toxic. So, uh, they, they have, and I've gone to the EPA four times I've met with them because we had 10,000 of our moms called the EPA after we found glyphosate in breast milk, they were pissed off. And so they invited me to go to the EPA. It happened to be on Rachel Carson's birthday, May 27th. And that was amazing. It was a, like, you know, serendipitous. And we brought 11 people. There were nine of them. We sat down instead of one hour, we talked for two hours and, um, and I said to them, you know, you don't have any studies proving that glyphosate is safe for, you know, for use with humans. And they said, well, you know, I said, you know, and they said, well, we have plenty of studies. I said, but not on humans. You don't. And they said, well, of course not. It's not ethical to test pesticides on humans. I said, well, if it's not ethical to test pesticides on humans, how is it ethical to allow pesticides in humans through our food and in our breast milk? You need to stop it. And you need to stop it. Now you're poisoning our children and our babies and it's criminal what you're doing. And, uh, they were a little shooken up. Uh, they did eventually do their own testing, but they claim that they didn't find glyphosate in breast milk. I wonder where they got those breast milk samples from. Maybe it was from the 1930s. I don't know, but uh, you know, um, they, they know what they're doing and they all, what they also, what I also know from my experience being a consumer representative on the, uh, California organic advisory committee, I was, a I was a, a, a consumer representative on that committee. There were farmers and doctors and I'm sorry, farmers and retailers and growers and certifiers. And I was the consumer representative. And what I know from that is when I looked at the list of what the California Department of Food and Agriculture um, compared to the USDA, you know, the U.S. Department of, of Food and or FDA, EPA, whatever, those or regulatory agencies, they, they put out these reports every year saying, look, we tested, you know, 1,200 samples for pesticides and 98% of them came below our allowable levels, right? Well, first of all, those allowable levels are like 30 parts per million on wheat, which is 30,000 parts per billion. 0.1 parts per billion has been shown to cause sex hormone changes, okay? And disruption of the gut bacteria and all that kind of stuff. So first of all, their levels are way ridiculous high. It's completely fraudulent to try to have the public feel safe because they've tested and the, and the levels that they found have been below those ridiculous levels. Okay. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is if you really look at it, because that's what moms do, right? A worried mom does better research than the FBI. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in that category. When you look at what they're actually testing for, 
they're testing when, and, and you compare that list of here's the pesticides you're testing for. And then here's the pesticides that are most commonly used on our food crops, right? You ask the farmers, you ask, you get a list from uh, the, the pesticide regulatory agencies, right? These are the pesticides that are most commonly sold and used in the United States. Here's that list. Guess how many on li this list that they're testing for were actually on this list? Take a wild guess. Zero. Two on two are from the federal government and three from California. So that's out of the most widely used, they're testing for two or three of them. And then they tell us, oh, look, the food supply is safe because, it, you know, the levels are 98 percent lower than the, 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 the you know, for the pesticides that we tested for. So it's a complete fraud. You know what what is what the regulatory agencies are doing are fraudulent when they are putting out information, propaganda that the food supply is safe. Um, it's, it's complete fraud. And so this is why I wish we had a couple of funders that would just give moms across America a million a year or something. And we could test every month, we could test 40 samples, which is a scientifically significant number of certain kinds of foods, you know, just orange juice, 40 samples, just, uh, which we did by the way, exposures, glyphosate and orange juice, and the citrus growers of, of, uh, association recommended that their, uh, citrus growers stop spraying glyphosate. So we did have a small win there. Um, but if, if we have to go after an entire industry, we need to test 40 samples of an entire industry, like just of baby formula or just of gluten-free food, which I'm very concerned about gluten-free food because there's a lot of ingredients in that, like lentils and peas and soy, you know, that are probably not organic and could have high levels of glyphosate. So I'm concerned that gluten-free food may have higher levels of glyphosate than non-gluten-free food. And uh, we need to test we need testing. So we need, we need about 40 to $60,000 a month. If anybody's out there, that's that kind of money to do that just for the labs. That's not even for moms across America to have any money. It's just, it's just for the labs. So it's, it's very expensive. Regarding the, the gluten-free food, um, just to follow up on, on what you were saying, are, are you saying that the non-organic versions have it? I just want to make sure that this, so the organic yes. ones are, are the safe ones. Yeah. And okay. the problem is there's not many organic gluten-free versions. There's not a lot of foods that are both organic and gluten-free. So people opt for the gluten-free, um, believing that, you know, that's going to be better for them. And in, in, in many cases it is, it is, but we have seen some testing from the book, Poison Foods of North America that show that some of the gluten-free products have higher levels of glyphosate than the non-gluten-free. And that's because they're using mung beans or peas or lentils or, garbanzo beans or soy or corn that has been sprayed with glyphosate and is not organic. And that just makes sense, right? It's the same thing with vegan and vegetarian foods, vegan vegetarian foods that contain the garbanzo beans and soy and corn and uh, wheat, all of those are going to have much higher levels. have been shown to have much higher levels of glyphosate than, uh, than non-vegan and vegetarian foods. And I'm not saying I'm, you know, my son's a vegan. I'm like, I, I'm not trying to be against any of those. I don't have, I'm not biased in that. I don't think anybody should just eat. We should tell anybody to eat any one way. I've just done metabolic testing and DNA testing. And I found out that I don't absorb certain compounds through plants as, as well as other people might, if they had certain genes. So I should eat some eggs now and then, and some, you know, lean meats and some fish. And I don't metabolize certain vitamins and minerals very well in other ways, right? I should eat some other type. So everybody should actually get that testing done before you choose what kind of nutritional diet you're going to go through. You should get genetic and metabolic testing. And I want to hear this business about, oh, they're going to get my genes and they're going to know my, my DNA. You know, what's the most important is that, you know, your DNA, you know, your DNA, and you know how your body metabolizes foods. That's the most important thing. Cause once you know that, and you, and you opt out of those certain foods that your body does not digest well. Uh, like I don't do well with gluten. I don't do well with dairy. Um, I can have it. I just have to take lactate or, you know, something like, but I, but, you know, knowing that supports me and not eating foods that cause inflammation in my body, which then lead to dis-ease, which then lead to, in some cases, taking pharmaceutical products, right. Which I don't do anymore, but most people do. And that's what that's what keeps people on the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical treadmill is consuming foods that you do not absorb well, that you do not metabolize well and, and toxins and pesticides and, you know, all these things, GMOs, uh, that's what keeps you on uh, dependent 
on big pharma, which is what I would like to get everybody off of that treadmill, and, you know, for big pharma. Um, so as part of that question about um, how prevalent all these drugs are in the food system, have any of them, has the EPA, the USDA taken any of them off the market? So they took DDT and PCBs off the market five years after they were both found in breast milk. So that's what we were, we were hoping would happen with glyphosate. When we tested for glyphosate in breast milk, we were hoping that within five years they would do that. They have not done that. They have still perpetuated to, uh, they have still claimed that glyphosate is not can cancerous and they still continue to allow it. And I am extremely frustrated with both parties, Republicans and Democrats have had, you know, elected officials that can refuse to take actions uh, about this. And, um, and it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's very discerning. I, I, I do have to say, I do have hope if um, Bobby Kennedy were to be elected, he has been very outspoken about glyphosate and about the food supply. And I do not believe he would take money from big ag or big pharma. And that's, that is my primary concern is, is, a, is any candidate or elected official taking money from big ag, big pharma, big tech, big oil? Because if they are, they are not your man or your woman. They are making decisions based on their profits, the corporation's profits, not based on your health or safety. So I would ask people to really look into whatever candidate you support. And I don't care about the party at this point anymore. I don't, I don't care about political parties. I care about whether or not that person is funded by big ag and big pharma. That's a... a and big oil and big tech. Yeah. Thank you. And of GMO versus glyphosate, which one is, is more concerning? If you have to choose something that is, um, that has glyphosate, but may not be GMO or something that is GMO, but does not have glyphosate, which one is the, is the better one or is it? I'm just not going to eat either <laughs> Of, um, for the general, is there research that shows which one is better? Like for the audience, I realize where you stand for yourself, but for the audience, if they had, a, if they were in that situation, oh, which one should we consider to be? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to recommend GMOs, but I've seen more studies about glyphosate than I have about GMOs. So just from a personal basis, like for instance, I haven't seen um, a ton of studies saying, for instance, that GMO papayas are particularly harmful to human health. Right? I have my doubts about them. I'm skeptical about them. Um, but, um, I have seen studies showing that off target mutations happen in CRISPR, you know, I, there just haven't been specifically linked to specific GMO foods for me to connect that. But there, there have been studies showing like, for instance, GMO soy, very harmful to the rats and the hamsters. Um, third generation of rats that ate GMO soy, soy were infertile. All right. So, I would not want to eat GMOs uh, as much as possible. I mean, it's, it's not like I, it's not like I don't ever, if I'm out at, you know, I'm, and uh, like I said, I'm traveling, there's times when I have chosen to eat something. And if I'm going to do that, I tell my body beforehand, I know how to process this food. I'm eating food. That's going to nourish me. I just consume it with like goodwill and, you know, good thoughts. And I try not to stress about it because stress increases you know, the dis-ease in your body. So if you are going to eat it, just absorb it and enjoy it and, you know, feel good about it. That's, that's all that I would say. Um, but I would definitely, I think I, I mostly, uh, really work hard to avoid glyphosate. Thank you. And I'm not sure if your presentation touched on it, but are, are you familiar with genetically modified microbes? And if so, um, what are they and how do they, uh, differ from genetically modified foods? Well, I'm not as uh, well versed in this as Jeffrey Smith is uh, from Institute for Responsible Technology, but what they have started to do because, well, you know, they try to fix the problems they created, right? So they destroyed the soil, right? With glyphosate and fertilizers. And now they're trying to genetically engineer the microbes to, to then uh, remediate the soil so that once they have uh, microbes that they have genetically engineered, they can patent them and they can say, Hey, here's our product to remediate your soil. Right. So they're just trying to make money off the very problem that they caused. And um, they're trying to genetically engineer microbes. And, and Jeffrey Smith points out that one of them was particularly harmful. It's, it was a microbe that had it been released. It was within a few hours of being released, I think, in the in the um, in the marketplace. It was a particular microbe that when introduced, when sprayed, I think, on crops, it was supposed to just get rid of certain kinds of weeds. But it actually turned um, every plant into like green goo. It just, like, just like, like, it just like 
made it go just like, ugh, you know, down and, and had it been released outside of a lab, it could have pretty much destroyed all plant life on the planet. You know what I mean? Like within a couple of decades or something, cause it, it, this stuff travels, it moves around and go, you know, birds eat it and pop, poop it down somewhere else, you know, wind trap. So some of them are extremely dangerous and, uh, and, and of course cannot be controlled in the environment. So what is very concerning to me is that these scientists are playing, they're, they're, they're playing, they're tinkering. I like, I love curiosity. I love innovation. I encourage innovation with my kids. Um, but when I see things happening, uh, in our food supply that are clearly not safe, um, then it gro- crosses over the border into criminal action in, in my eyes. And when I, I read a book called Bold, um, something, something uh, Dime, D- Diamantes, I think is his last name. And he talked about how there were, uh, there was a, a CEO of a major corporation. I don't remember which one, I think it was a tech company, but he would come into his board meeting every month with a t-shirt on that said safety last considering, you know, they want innovation first and they want safety last. And that's what's happening in the food supply. They're putting safety last and they're putting profits first. And it's, it's extremely, you know, it's extremely concerning to me as a mother that this is continuing to happen because they're killing off the future of our country without healthy children. I mean, one out of two of our children having autism by the year 2032, how are we going to function? We're, we are going to cripple the human race, you know, and that's not, that's not even including fertility. You don't get half the amount of sperm we used to have. The only people that are going to be able to procreate are going to be the elite, say 20, 30, 40 years from now, maybe if this continues in that direction, our children will children, our children's children will not be able to procreate. And, and, and it's played out in the rat studies like that. It's already shown third, fourth generation are unviable. I'm, I'm very concerned that it ha- may have already happened. We may already be on that pathway and this is, this may be what is happening. So in that case, like Ann just mentioned, stress halts digestion, stress creates causes heart disease. By the way, I need to mention that heart disease is the number one killer in America. It's not cancer folks, it's heart disease. And you don't hear about heart disease because I believe heart disease is the number one killer of women. Not as many people care about women. Cancer is the number one killer of men more of our politicians anyway, care about men and cancer, uh, makes big pharma an awful lot of money. Heart disease does not, you have a heart attack, you die period. Right. It is, it does not make people a lot of money. So what I have done, if I could segue into this just a little bit, um, I got a test three months ago and found out that I had intermediate heart disease. I had a reading on the scale of 4.5 means you could have a heart attack in about five years. I'm only 50 that I'm not interested in that. And I had myocarditis and thickening the outer heart wall and inner heart wall, like all kinds of stuff going on. I'm like, what is going on now? I've been under a lot of stress recently and I have had a stress occupation for the past 11 years. I've been attacked by Monsanto for years. You know, I've had a lot of stress going on. So that's related. My diet's pretty awesome. My exercise is pretty awesome. So it's mostly, I believe, stress and genetics. Um, But they told me that you can reverse heart disease in three to six months. I was like, wait a second. If you can reverse heart disease in three to six months, mostly with diet and exercise, Why is it the number one killer in America? And they said, well, because people aren't finding out about it. The current testing now, which it costs anywhere from $7,000 to $100,000 for angiograms and nuclear stress tests and all these things, they have to be prescribed by a doctor and you pretty much have to have symptoms. And most people don't have symptoms for heart disease, right? And less than 1% of people go to a cardiologist. Um, People just don't find out that they have it. But this new test, it's called a multifunction cardiogram test that I now have, I've started my own company called HeartWise Health. It's heartwisehealth.com. We conduct the test. It's only available about a dozen places across the country. And I have one now and I'm conducting testing. And I want people to find out about this because what really made me mad was when I was told that the symptoms for small ventricle heart disease, which is what I have and which which is the number one killer of women, are the same symptoms as anxiety, tightness in the chest and fatigue. Now, nobody tells you that. And how many women feel like they have anxiety? (laughs) Like practically every woman, you know? And so this really makes me mad because once again, women are being, um, you know, seen as second-class citizens. Our healthcare is not being seen as a priority. So that's why we started 
uh, the Women's Heart Care Program at Moms Across America and HeartWise Health. My company is a sponsor of Moms Across America. And um, we, we are just working hard to get the testing. I mean, get the test done anywhere, you know, but there's only a dozen places right now. So I'm also looking for people who want to be test takers, who want to invest and in, start a business and conduct this testing and get it all across the country and especially get women tested to discern whether or not they have heart disease. And what we're finding, the first doctor that we rolled it out with, he had 30 patients tested, 87% of the people had abnormal levels above a two and uh, a 25 to 33% of them had severe heart disease, but over four, uh, anywhere, you know, up to about a four or five, I don't know, you can reverse it. Right. And so I did in the past two and a half months, I took a supplement called cardio miracle. That was the main thing I did. I did reduce my stress. I definitely took, took actions to reduce my stress or some people I'm just not talking to right now. I love them, but I released them. Right. Um, and, um, uh, and I got my levels down to a 3.0 in two and a half months. So I'm already reducing heart disease. And so I think in a way the universe gave this to me because I have a platform and because I can, I'm willing to speak about this and I'm willing to share like, look, if you have heart disease, you can reverse it. Like, I did not know that, you know, so a lot of people did not, do not know this. And so I want people to know about it. And um, thank you for giving me the platform to talk about this. I know that wasn't the question, but that's the no, answer I, I got. Anyways, if, right I may give, if I may give a plug for what we're doing, the real truth about health, we actually have a number of speakers who reverse heart disease through lifestyle and, and they're doing it all the time. Um, we've had previous speakers like Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Um, yes. We've done it and we've got a number of speakers. So I highly suggest that you check Go out. On, our yes. Yep. Yes. yes. There's a lot of people that do that. So please connect. And you know, what bugged me was Joel Kahn told me that only less than 1% of the population goes to a cardiologist to get a screening, right? That's not good enough folks. Like we need, you know, we need to get, we need to know what's going on in our bodies so that we know how to take care of our bodies. That's the most important message. I think I want people to know is know your body, you know, get your testing done, metabolic testing, get your DNA testing done, uh, get this heart test done, get, whatever tests done that you need to get done to know what's going on for you. Otherwise you're throwing a bunch of expensive supplements at your body when you don't know if you even need it, you know, and for instance, cardio miracle I'm taking, I don't have to take 10 other supplements because they're all in cardio miracle. Right. And so, um, and, and cardio miracle has been proven to, has been shown to help reverse heart disease, kidney disease, periodontal disease. And you can get that on moms across America, um, dot org as well. Great. Thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, so if I may ask you, uh, um, what is biomilk? Is, is this the, is this in the best interest of babies? And, uh, uh, is, is it as good as nursing? No, I would say that it's not. It's Bill Gates and Zuckerman. I think Zuckerberg, uh, have come together. Um, and it's one other guy, I forgot his name. Maybe Anne will remember, um, a couple, couple of men, very wealthy men. Oh, Jeff Bezos, I believe have come together to fund, um, you know, milk that can be made in a lab that is, um, not, you know, it's not from mothers. It's, it's an, I, I don't want to say it's another effort to eliminate women and mothers, but that's definitely a result that will happen if they're successful. Um, they think that they will just be able to perpetuate the human race, you know, without, uh, normal, you know, sexual reproduction and pregnancy and all of that. And I, I do have to say, I think they're partially doing this because they can see the writing on the wall. They can see the problems. They can see the miscarriages that are happening. They can see the infertility. They can see that a lot of these babies are going to have to be grown in a lab. And um, when a woman can't conceive, and if she has a baby grown in a lab, she's going to need some form of breast milk, right? She's going to need, she if she can't conceive and get pregnant, she's not going to be able to produce the milk for her lab grown baby. So I think they are looking down the road and trying to create a solution um, for this horrific problem that they, I mean, you know, they may not be very smart in some ways, but they are smart in other ways. They can see what's happening to the human population. We are declining. We are not going through a human population boom like the GMO proponents say we are. In Japan, they're developing all kinds of rob, rob, robots because the projections of their human population, you know, their, the, the um, births are declining so much that they're not going to have people to take care of the elderly. When the current population gets to be old, there's going to be nobody to take care of them, you know? And so they're going to need robots. And so we're, we don't have, um, we, we don't have the human population boom that they're saying we're going to have. And so they're concerned about needing to, I mean, there's labs now that can 
grow babies, right? Like in pots that's their, or they're promoting that anyway, that they're going to be developing that. So when you grow a baby in a pod and not in a human mom, you're going to need breast milk for them. So I can see where they're going with this, but I, I'm highly suspect that it would be healthy at all. Considering I mean, look at GMO soy in formula right now, it's loaded with junk. It's loaded with fructose and dyes and chemicals and you know, all kinds of things that are going to actually destroy the human biome. They're going to destroy the baby's immune system, you know, and they're promoting vaccines that are supposed to be, you know, boosting a baby's immune system, but they're actually destroying the baby's immune system. So these men simply, they may have good intentions, but they don't really know what they're doing. They really are perpetuating more problems, creating more problems and, and the decline of the human race. Thank you. And what, um, what do you consider ultra processed food and, and what's wrong with ultra processed food? Well, ultra processed food, I'm not a nutritionist, I have to say, but, um, it simply contains way too many ingredients that are harmful, harmful for the health. They contain, you know, highly processed oils, highly processed sugars, um, ingredients that are basically like garbage, you know, cheap junk garbage. They may fill up your stomach and they may taste good, but uh, they don't give you the nutrition that you need. And therefore you continue to be hungry and you continue to eat more of that product or other products that are harmful for you. And what you end up having is, um, a, a feeling of eating and being satiated because of the taste, but your body is not satiated as far as nutrients go. And I want to bring up um, a story about, you know, I mentioned the, the, the hamsters, right. And the violence that was, uh, stopped was, was halted when those hamsters were given vitamin B3. Well, there's a book called food. I'm going to grab it right now. I always have this by me. Cause it's one of the most important books out there. It's called food and behavior, the natural connection by Barbara Stitt. She's an award, a lifetime achievement award winner. And she studied par parolees and criminals and high school dropouts, people with, you know, basically undesirable behavior, violent behavior in society. And she got an award for this because what she found was that the number one thing that all of the serial killers and parolees and criminals had in common was not their socioeconomic background or their race, as some people might think. It was the fact that they bragged that they lived on junk food. They, you know, they ate things like, well, I guess I can't name brand names, but they ate junk food, you know, frozen foods, things you put up in the microwave, sodas, candy, chips, you know, all of that stuff. They brag, that's it. They lived on it. They're like, oh, all I eat is, you know, this kind of soda and that kind of pizza or this kind of hot pockets or this kind of whatever, you know, like they just bragged that they lived on junk food. And so what happens then is that you don't, your brain doesn't get the nutrients, especially the prefrontal frontal cortex, where you have your decision-making it's devoid of vitamin Bs actually is one of the most important ones. And, and then those brain neurons don't connect and make decisions the way they're supposed to. And what she found was when she put those prisoners on a whole food diet, you know, fresh foods that she took the, the sodas out of the schools and out of the prisons. Um, and when she took those sodas and junk foods and all those out and gave them whole healthy, fresh foods, the, for instance, the high school went from a, a school of 5,000, they had 500 kids that would drop out every year. It went down to 14 in one year. And the prisons, the recidivism rate switched. Instead of 70% going out and coming back to prison, 70% would go out and stay out of prison. They would not come back. Only 30% would come back. And so her studies have shown that eating a healthy whole food diet, and at the time they were, she didn't know it, but I don't think, but they were avoiding GMOs and glyphosate. They, but just because they weren't labeled in the food supply, the study was done in the, the late nineties. And, um, and so by doing that, by switching your food out, you support your body and your brain to function properly, you know, better and to make better decisions and to live a more productive life and to contribute to society. And it, that's, that's what we all want for each other and for our children. Thank you. So, um, what does the term GMO two GMO 2.0 mean? Um, and, um, and why does Jeffrey Smith say it is creating an, an existential threat to humanity? Is that, is that, well, I mentioned that a little bit before earlier, uh, well, CRISPR is really what they call, um, gen, you know, GMO 2.0 gene editing and CRISPR. Um, but he also does refer to the microbe, uh, you know, the genetically modified mi microbes, as I already mentioned, but the thing, the thing about, um, 
CRISPR that's very concerning and gene editing. Gene editing and gene drives or gene drives are when you can epigenetically engineer something and it will affect all future generations. Like for instance, they could genetically engineer um, mice to have blue eyes and then all of the babies will have blue eyes after that genetic, you know, engineer. So you can imagine what would happen in humans if people decided, you know, that a certain look for a certain race was superior and they started genetically engineering for that. Um, and also there, there was a movie, my goodness, I forgot what it was called now, but it was all about CRISPR and gene editing. And, um, and there was a man on there who was doing gene editing CRISPR in his garage. You you can buy the kit for, (coughs) I don't know if it's $60 or $160 or something like that. And he was genetically engineering dogs to, uh, to like glow in the dark or something like that. And he admitted at the end of the movie that, that, that mother dog had had like 14 different, um, miscarriages, you know, like, like pregnancies where it just, they, they just kept dying. The babies just kept dying and that he was not successful in making it happen. And so my concern is that, you know, this tinkering with life, whether it's human life or animal life, is causing reproduction. I mean, causing repercussions that are tragic and that are abusive, right. To these animals and, and to the plants, it causes them to do things like toughen up. Like for instance, they genetically engineered alfalfa. So we want, we should be on the lookout for, we do not want GMO wheat, by the way, I think it was um, Brazil or Argentina that, that uh, did approve some GMO wheat for in a small area, but um, the GMO alfalfa that was approved I talked to a farmer that fought that and went to the Supreme Court to fight that uh, GMO alfalfa release. And they they won in the Supreme Court. But then um, one of our government officials, uh, is his name Michael Taylor? I'm sorry, my brain is not remembering that right now. But he, he overturned that and, and approved, I don't know how you could overturn the Supreme Court, but he went ahead and approved GMO alfalfa anyway. And this farmer, Pat Trask, told me that when that alfalfa was genetically engineered, it, it toughened up. It's kind of like, you know, if you cut something, it's going to form a scar, right? It's going to, it's going to react. It's not just going to do nothing. And so this alfalfa toughened up and instead of having more protein, which is what the farmers want, it had more fiber and that to them, it's like eating junk food. They, they don't want more fiber. They want more protein for their animals to grow fat and, you know, big, you have to have some fiber of course, but, um, yeah, it is, so they did not want GMO alfalfa because also it would propagate, it would just go everywhere. It, it would be, it's a perennial too, right? So it would just keep growing every year and they wouldn't be able to get it out of their system. So, so they really fought that. And, um, and so my point is, is that these GMOs, there are reactions, you know, and in this case, in the alfalfa, it had more fiber, it toughened up, it was less desirable. And that was exact opposite of what they intended. And thank you, Anne. The movie that I'm talking about with this guy who's trying to genetically engineer dogs to glow in the dark is called Unnatu- Unnatural Selection. It's on Netflix. Okay. And that's on Netflix, you said. So um, can you explain what mRNA vaccinology in livestock means? And what about mRNA in the food supply? Yeah. So uh, yeah, again, I'm not a scientist, so I can't really talk exactly about the mRNA, um, you, you know, the, the function of it, as well as, uh, for instance, maybe Stephanie Senep would, you could, you should watch our previous episode we did yesterday, if you want to hear her explanation on that. But from, from what I know, um, mRNA vaccines have actually been in our meat since 2018. They started using them in pigs in the swine flu vaccine. So I'm not going to say just because it is it's okay. It ought to be right. It's it, to me, it's, it's not okay, but the MRNA technology does alter, you know, the, uh, the RNA, it alters the, the cells of the body and in ways that we do not know, um, how they're going to, you know, um, alter the rest of the body or the function of the body. And, um, and I'm very concerned about this MRNA technology that they are now saying is going to be injected into our beef cattle. They're going to be, requiring our, you know, our, our cattle to have that injection. And what I am happy to see is that uh, there are many farmers, ranchers, like white oak pastures, for instance, instance that have put out videos saying that they will not use the MRNA vaccine on their cows. And I would, I would venture to guess that most 
I mean, probably all organic farmer, I mean, maybe not all, but if they're big corporations, but most, all the organic farmers I know personally would not use mRNA vaccine on there. So I would say it was, it's a pretty safe bet. If you continue purchasing organic or, and, or grass fed, um, meat products that you're not going to have to worry about that. But the, again, the main thing is ask them, you know, know your farmer, ask them if they get, I would imagine if they got 10 people, you know, let's just say a certain, uh, medium sized, you know, meat producer got 10 people to email them or call them and say, Hey, are you going to be using this MRNA vaccine? They would eventually put on their website. We are not using the MRNA vaccine. Do you know what I mean? They, they, it doesn't take that many people for that to be con- you know, to contact them, to be concerned about an issue for them to address it. So um, I would just do that. Ask them. And what is the purpose of the MRNA? Is that to combat the disease, like the viruses that these animals? Yes. Yeah. Get? And and what, what they can do with it is to combat specific diseases, right? They genetically engineer it so it can go after specific di- diseases and, and make it, it's supposed to be very selective and very effective and, you know, train the body to, uh, produce the antibodies to go after it and attack it. Again, I'm not a scientist, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's another new solution for them that they see as progress without having proof that it's, it's safe. And, and there are reports of people who have injected and many of the cows dead were died afterwards. So, you know, I mean, that's not a good sign, you know? No, no, definitely not. So would, um, would that be considered organic though? An animal that was injected with MRNA would that, if we got organic meat, would that mean that it didn't, it did not mm. contain the MRNA vaccine? I believe there's no regulation saying that they can't, but the, so I, I, I'm not good. I'm going to say that I'm, I'm not sure, pretty totally sure about that. I, I've heard somebody be very definitive about this recently. And I think what they said, if my, if I, my memory is correct, that that uh, organic farmers could inject uh, their animals with the mRNA vaccine um, because there's no regulation saying they can't, right? And so what there's some activists are doing are saying we've got to contact, you know, these different uh, livestock growing associations and tell them it needs to be written down and required, right? That it is not allowed, it, that organic must exclude, you know, just like when you go to the organic uh, standards board, NOSB, National Organic Standard Boards meeting, there's activists there like Alexis baden Mayer has to be dragged out by her ankles and her feet because, you know, she doesn't want certain products to be allowed in organic, right? And she's done this for, for decades. So um, when something new comes in the market like mRNA, it's allowed until it's not allowed right? But that doesn't mean that it's there because most organic farmers are, have no interest in, you know, introducing, uh, you know, unknown genetically modified substances into their, their cattle. They're just, they're not interested in that. And what were, what are some of the things that people would assume would not be in, in organic, like that this woman was, was fighting against that, that actually is allowed to be labeled as organic? Well, Karen Geenan used to be allowed in organic and, um, and then I believe it wasn't for a while and it may be allowed again. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sorry, I'm not up on that, but I know that because my son had a Karen Geenan allergy and, um, he would eat organic chicken and his mouth would break out in a rash. I'm like, what is going on here? And then I saw that it had Karen Geenan in it. And my iridologist that I took my son to checks the iris that she was the only one that could tell us that he had a Karen Geenan allergy and it was confirmed when I saw that he had a reaction after he ate organic chicken meat, uh, you know, lunch meat that had Karen Geenan in it. And so that's something that, you know, a lot of people may or may not care that it's inorganic, but you know, a lot of people fought to get it out of organic and for a little while it was not allowed and it, it may be allowed back in again. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't remember. There's just, there's so much, I'm sorry, Michael, there's so much information that some of, some of this stuff is starting to either slip on me or I haven't kept up with because, uh, there, there's just so much going on in the food supply right now. So much. No, no need to apologize. You, you, you definitely know a lot of stuff and we appreciate that. So, um, well, let, let's end with, um, how, how do you, and how should other people go, at, uh, go about inspiring people to step up and make a difference in the areas that you've spoken about? Well, I try to inspire people. I don't know. I guess I, I guess I would say, um, by just getting, becoming aware by learning more and looking at what you can do. And I'll give an example in, in closing. Um, my son was, my eldest son, Ben was about nine years old 
And he had been experiencing rashes around his mouth, like a red line, almost like a clown mouth. Like it looked like being sucked on by a vacuum cleaner and his lips were red and swollen and cracked and bleeding. And it, I mean, this had been going on for two weeks at a time for seven months on and off. And we took him to all, six different doctors and they all just wanted to slap a cream on it and it made it worse. You know, it, it just would not go away. And um, he sat at the kitchen table one day and looked at me and said, mom, I wish all my allergies would just go away. And I said, me too, buddy. But in my head, I was thinking that's never going to And That was because the doctors had told me his food allergies were only going to get worse, especially his nut allergy. They could, it could kill him with it, you know, increased exposure. And then I realized what my brain was saying. I heard myself like that, you know, saying that's never going to happen. I was like, wait a second. I'm not committed to that. I'm committed to being courageous and creative and making a contribution in the world. Like that's sort of like the possibility that I created for myself. And so I said, um, I'm going to take another look at that because I don't want to be a victim. I don't want my son to be a victim and be like, look at him as small, right? As somebody who can't do anything about that. And I thought about my cousin, Sarah, who had um, gone or gone gluten-free. And then after a year, she was able to eat a piece of birthday cake or a piece of pizza at a birthday party. And I thought about her and I told my son about her. I said, would you like to, you like one day, maybe a year from now, eat a slice of pizza at a birthday party? And, and he said, yes. And I said, well, then would you be my partner in your health? Would you drink green drinks and try alternative things like, you know, acupuncture or Chinese herbs or whatever? He said, yes. And I said, then you've got a deal, buddy. And I took my hand out and shook his hand and said, I promise you, you will get better. Now, that was scary for me because I really didn't know how he was going to get better. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that if I made a promise to my son, if I put my word on the line, I would step up and take actions that I never would have taken before. And my son in partnership with me, right. Would take actions that he had never taken before. And we did, we went GMO free within four months. His rashes were dramatically reduced. They only lasted two or three days. And it was only a faint pink line under his lip when he was exposed again. And a year later when he was eating all organic, because his other brother, brother had those, you know, autism symptoms, we went up hundred percent organic, his al we retested him and his allergy levels went from a 19 down to a 0.2. Wow. And he is now, he is adamant. He will only eat organic. If we go out to a restaurant where there's no organic food, he will not eat. He will have a glass of water <laughs> maybe. Right. And, um, and so, and he eats an organic whole food plant-based diet, he has not been to the doctor since for any reason for anything other than a sports checkup. That's it. He's one of the, he, when we got COVID, he coughed for a day and fell asleep. I mean, he coughed like two times that day and slept that day. And then that was it. He was up and about the next day. He's like probably one of the healthiest people I know. And he inspires other people. He's done talks at churches. He wants to be a nutritional scientist. He wants to be he's going to school for that and be a health coach someday. And, you know, um, I, that gives me a huge amount of peace of mind. So I would say to people, and I remember, by the way, during that exchange, one thing I didn't mention was I had a moment in my head where I said, I don't care if I have to eat bird seed with my son, he's going to get better. You know what I mean? I had that moment. I, I chose, I made a very distinctive choice that this kid is going to get better. I'm going to do this with him. So that's the, really the main thing is just choose, choose health and, and the, the real truth about health, right? Choose health instead of choosing ignorance, choose discomfort instead of choosing comfort, right? Choose action instead of inaction, choose to make a promise to yourself make a promise to somebody else, put your word on the line. Cause that's all we have is our word. And that's all we have is relationships for real in life. We don't have things there. They could all be gone in a second in a storm or whatever, right? All we really have is our word and our relationships. So choose health and you will create health that I promise you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Zen. this, this has yeah. really been informative and inspiring. Yeah. So the, the audience, uh, I'm sure would like to share their, their thanks and appreciation for you taking your time. So we're going to open up the mics and hear a cacophony of thanks. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.